Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for the possibility to give a talk in this conference. I will share my screen. So actually this is a joint talk with Mikko Karjalainen, who is no longer working at our university, but he has made a lot of work with this uh, title stack and uh, JSX graph together. So I will explain very shortly what uh, is stack. I don't think I have uh, much time to give many examples or so, but uh, maybe if somebody of the participants has never heard about stack, then maybe some information is uh, in order. And then uh, there will be a second part about 20 minutes. It will be a video by Mikko Karjalainen and uh, he will explain the bind point commands, which more or less are the basic elements when you want to combine stack problems with JSX graph. And uh, the name uh, stack comes from this system for teaching and assessment using computer algebra kernel. There are some links uh, that I will not open, but uh, maybe if you are interested, you can see them in the recordings of the conference and have a closer look. So it was created by Chris Sangwin uh, more than 15 years ago, and uh, it has been constantly developed since that. And um, the main three persons who are responsible for the development are Sangwin, Matti Harjula from our university, other university and then Tim Hunt from Britain also and uh, I'm very happy that Matti Harjula is also present in this conference because if you have uh, difficult questions then he will uh, perhaps answer them much better than I do. Uh, so the history of using stack at Aalto University goes back to more than 10 years ago Antti Rasila was then uh, a lecturer responsible for computer-aided math teaching, and uh, he looked at different possibilities to use some uh, systems like this. And uh, I think uh, Stack was uh, very useful because it's free, and uh, I think it was one of the main reasons to start exploring the possibility to use it more. And um, today we use it um, on basically all math courses. I teach, I think, four courses this year, and all courses use the stack problems. And uh, there are also some people in physics and economy departments who use the system. Matti Harjula tried to calculate some estimate how many stack problems are solved by our students and uh, I think he came up with this 200,000 students within half a year or so. So this means that it's like student one, problem one, student one, problem two, and then you end up with 200,000, uh, the number 200,000. And um, in the beginning of this year, we also organized a mock course which used uh, materials that combine stack problems and um, JSX graph uh, figures in, in a basic calculus course for first year students, I would say. And it was part of the items project, which some of you are familiar with, and uh, it's led by Alfred Wasserman. So there's a big list of um, uh, properties uh, that uh, Stack has. I think most of the participants of the conference are familiar with uh, the ideas of this kind of uh, business. So it's not necessary to read everything through, but uh, I will go to the last slide. And um, 
The main point with stack is that it can handle uh, algebraic expressions and uh, study if the two different expressions are equivalent. It uses the Maxima computer algebra system uh, for this, and uh, it seems to be very efficient in this uh, job. And um, the last thing, I, I will go to the last line. Uh, of course, producing problems like this is takes a lot of time and maybe also money because you need people to do it. The lecturer, as a lecturer, I cannot produce all the problems that we use uh, in the courses. So we need some people and especially Miko has been very useful for this. And um, uh, when you have a lot of problems, you may want to share them with other people and this abacus portal uh, is uh, one way to do it. It's not completely open, but you have to produce some uh, material for yourself and then you can uh, see also what the others have done. So uh, I will show uh, an example of, oops, of a stack problem. It's not uh, the simplest one, uh, but uh, it has some ideas what you can do. So it's about even and odd function. And then it has also some interactive part, but it's rather limited. It's just draws a picture from the formula that the student gives. So we want an even extension for this graph. And uh, it shows uh, how the answer looks like and it's not correct and you must find something better. Okay, so this was the uh, my part and uh, I will go then to the video part. Uh, this uh, video was originally presented by Miko in the Tallinn Stack Conference. It's about 20 minutes long and I think I have exactly 20 minutes time. So I think it's time to start. I hope you will comment if you can't hear the sound from the video, but I think I crossed the share sound button. So let's try. Let us start by taking a look into how JSX graph visualizations are created in Stack. Note that Stack comes with its own implementation of JSX graph with some additional features. The key difference between the official JSX graph filter and the implementation provided by Stack is really in the way in which we have to initialize our JXG board objects. So this is exactly what we'll be interested in in this first example, where we don't have any user inputs yet. Just some random text here on the left, an excerpt from the metamorphosis by Kafka, to be precise. And here we have this JSX graph board, or a multitude of boards actually. One with a bar chart here, and another board with a pie chart, both depicting the number of each letter in this text section. Note that although in the following examples we'll be focusing on simple geometric objects, JSX Graph does actually offer a wider variety of data visualization tools, like these charts, for example. So, how can we create something like this with Stack? Well, first of all, the code in a question like this goes here inside the question text field in the Stack editor. Now, actually, let me open this code in an external editor so we can have a better look. So here's the question text. Up there and down here, there's really just the text section of our question. And the part that we are really interested in is here. So in order to create a JSX graph board in stack, we always start with these JSX graph blocks. These blocks define a HTML div element 
that is used to store our board object. Hence we need to place these blocks in the location where we also wish our board to be created in. So for example, in this question I've chosen that I want the board to appear right after this paragraph that ends and divided by arches into stiff sections. So for uh, I place the blocks after this section here or after this paragraph and I've also added some styling around here in order to make the text wrap around the board. And notice also here inside the first JSX graph block we can define the width and the height of the div element and hence this will also be the dimensions for the board object. Remember to include these quotation marks around the values and also to mark these units whether you want the dimensions to be measured in pixels or something else. Then between these JSX graph blocks here is where all the code will go. That is all our JavaScript concerning the JSX graph board and all of its child objects. And just a quick remark here that the scope of this code is local or function level. Hence any variables defined between these two JSX graph blocks are not available anywhere else. Now what re we really want to learn from this code here is to see how the JXG board object is initialized and here it is. We define a variable for convenience, I usually just call it a board, and then call this function jxg.jsxgraph.initboard. And here, as always with JSX graph, the only obligatory argument is the ID of the div element that is used to host our board. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the location of these JSX graph blocks here tells stack where we want this container div to be located in. And unlike the official JSX graph filter, Stack does not allow us to freely name this div element. Instead, it will automatically generate an ID that is then stored in this variable div ID or also the variable board ID. This is done to avoid name collision, even if we have multiple copies of the same question on a single page. So, that's the bare minimum required to create a JXG board object in the stack environment. Next come all the little things. All the other objects and whatnots we want to draw, they go here. Like in this example, the code required to create those two charts looks like this. Okay, next we will unravel the different input binding functions provided by Stack. These are the handy Stack specific functions with which we can accomplish interactivity between the JSX graph objects and our Stack question. For example, here we have a JXG board object with these two points, one called P1 and the other called P2. Now both of these points are movable, though notice that as I move around this point P2, nothing else really happens. But as I move the, uh, the point P1 around, we can see that also the value here in this ANS1 input field changes as well. And actually, it is tracking the coordinates of this point P1 in this list, where the first element is the X coordinate of this point, and the second element is the Y coordinate of this point P1. And this is what we mean by binding in the context of stack and JSX graph integration. Here the point P1 and the input ANS1 have, uh, have been bound with a stack bind point function, but the point P2 has not been bound and hence we call it a free point. Now keep in mind the location of these two points as I click check and reload the page. 
Notice that stack remembered where we moved this bound point P1, but it has not kept track of this free point P2, and so it's been returned to its initial location here. And another thing to notice is that here in the question feedback and also or in all the answer tests in this question, we can now access the coordinates of this bound point, like so. So potentially what we could do with the following knowledge is we could in fact build an answer test that checks whether a point or a set of points in a graph meet some given criteria. And this skill in itself can be utilized to create a vast number of dissimilar questions. For example, something like this. So, let's take a closer look what's happening in this question text over here. So, here's the question text from this two-point example. Notice that we've again introduced the board with these JSX graph blocks, though this time we haven't changed the width or the height of the div element, but we've done something else here. What this new part input ref ans1 does is it asks stack to give us a reference to this input ans1, which is uh, created by this question block or the input ans1 block down here. And we've also chosen a convenient name for this reference, in this case this ans1 ref. So inside the JavaScript here, the variable ans1 ref now stores the ID of this input field ans1. Now, why we want to do it like this, you might ask. Well, the reason is that stack automatically generates the ID for each input field, just like it automatically generates those IDs for the JSX graph board objects, in order to avoid name collision, should we have multiple questions on one page. And keeping track of these IDs manually would be rather tiresome, so luckily with this functionality we don't need to do that. Then, here in the JavaScript, we have initialized the board object pretty much like we did before. Just this time we've set its default access to be visible, like this. Next we've created those two points, P1 and P2, which is done by calling this create function from the board object. And here in the first argument, we tell that we want this to be a point. And for a point object, the second argument has to be this list with the x and y coordinates of the point's initial location. And in the third argument here, we need to specify the attributes we want to change. So in this case, I've changed the names as well as the color of the outlines and the color of the interiors of these two points. So notice that these object attributes in JSX graph are always specified with this JS object notation, like this. And lastly here, I've used this stack JXG bind point function to accomplish the input binding. And with these stack binding functions, the first argument is always the input reference. So in this case, this ans1 ref. And the second argument, or the third argument, are the object or the objects that we want to bind. So in this case, it's this point P1 defined here. Next, I'll give you a quick overview of all the other binding functions stack has to offer. So consider, for example, a case similar to the previous question, where we had these two points P1 and P2. But this time, we want to bind both of these points instead of just one. Now, what you could do, of course, is to create two inputs, one for each point. 
but stack also offers a neater way of doing this with this bind point dual function with which you can bind two points with a single input and here again the first argument is the input reference and then come the points we want to bind so in this case these are the points p1 and p2 and notice that this time the input is stored as a list with two nested lists as its element, elements, like this. Or from here we get a better view. So this would be the answer one, or the answer one input. And here the first elements, or the elements of the first list are the coordinates of the point P1. And the elements of the second list are the coordinates of this point P2. Or, I hope you like vectors, as it's often really useful to interpret these lists as vectors. Like in this case, we could say that the first element of ANS1 is the position vector of the point P1, and the second element is the position vector of the point P2. Another binding function we got here is this bind point relative function, which is very similar to the bind point dual. The only exception here is that the second element in this list in the input are the coordinates of this point P2 relative to the first point P1. Now, this function might be especially handy when dealing with vectors, like some, something like this. As, of course, again, in vector notation, this is the same as the vector difference of the position vectors of the points P2 and P1. And the last of these point binding functions is this bind point direction which again resembles the two functions I just mentioned, with the exception that this time the second element stored in this list is a list where the first element is this directional angle of this vector connecting the points P1 and P2. It is the non-reflex angle between these two lines. The line going from P1 in the direction of the x-axis and a line drawn through the points P1 and P2. And the second element in this list is the magnitude of this vector. And here you can see the calculations. Notice that this directional angle here is calculated with this atom 2 function and given in radians. And lastly but not leastly we have this bind slider function And here the first argument is again the input reference, but this time the second argument is not a point. Instead, it's a JXG slider object, which usually looks something like this. So, when I now reload uh, this page with a bound slider, we see that the VLE has stored the position of this slider point. And here in the input, we also have the value of the slider, which in this example is also the radius of this circle. So, these are currently all the ready-made binding functions you can find in Stack. This far in these examples, we've only talked about what in the industry is called one-way binding. That is, the bindings transferred the position of something in the graph to the input and also retrieved this stored value from the input after the page was reloaded. 
Now, in addition to this, Stack also supports two-way binding, which means that we also track the input values after the page has been loaded, so that if the values change due to any action, then all the graphs are also updated accordingly. And the reason why we want to do it like this should be clear from the, this example here. So here we have two graphs, each with one slider and one point. And we also have these two inputs down here. So what we've, we have actually done here is that both of these points have been bound to this same input with the bind point function. And the same thing has been done with the sliders. They are both bound to this second input here with the bind slider function. So the two-way binding allows us or allows these two graphs to move in sync like this. And also if these input fields are left visible like in this example, the two-way binding also enables us to change the input values by hand like so. And these changes are instantly applied to all of our graphs, as you can see. So, apart from those ready-made binding methods, Stack does also support dynamical binding to some extent, though this topic is so complicated that we will only discuss it here briefly. Consider, for example, a case like this, where we have a triangle and we want to keep track of the coordinates of all of these vertices. But we would also like to know the values of these interior angles as well, like this. Now, of course, you could accomplish this with the point binding functions we mentioned earlier, but that's probably not the ideal solution in this situation. As, for example, maybe we later decided that we'd like this polygon to have more than just these three vertices. Well, then we'd probably need to add more and more inputs as we added more vertices. But in this question, we actually only use one input to store all the necessary data, which is handy as JSX graph already has functions that can give us uh, these coordinates and the, also the values of these angles. And for that matter, the number of vertices in this question isn't really carved in stone either. I think this is everything I wanted to show today. Thank you.